So thank you so much, first and foremost, everybody, for joining us for our fifth installment of Magically Live. Um, we today are going to be talking about breaking down barriers and understanding and implementing WCAG 2.2. Um, so as you can see, if you weren't here before, when I read the quote, uh, we had an accessibility quote on our, um, slide deck and it says the more accessible the web, the more valuable it is to everyone, which is lovely. And so at, on the topic of conferences, um, Erin and Tarveen will be attending CSUN this spring, which is very exciting. If you or anyone from your organization is attending, feel free to let us know, reach out to us on LinkedIn or anything like that. And we would love to get these lovely ladies to connect with you. All right. So just a little agenda for us today. First, we're kind of just going to be talking about WCAG and what it's been for the last few years, um, give you a little rundown about that. And then we'll look at WCAG 2.2, which is upcoming, hasn't been released yet, but we'll give you a little overview of kind of what it's going to entail. Um, some key changes between the WCAG 2.1 and WCAG 2.2. Uh, technical implementation, and then we'll go into a QA portion after that. So if you do have any questions, you can go ahead and drop them in the QA box below and we'll get to them during the QA portion. Um, and there, we also have CC's uh, closed captions enabled, sorry. <laughs> so if you wanna hit the CC button at the bottom, you totally can. All right, and I think to start us off, we're just gonna do a poll question first. Oh, I'm sorry, I totally skipped out on introductions. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my name is Anjali Lawani. I am a senior consultant for Magic EdTech, and today I'm joined by Tarveen and Erin. Tarveen, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Anjali. Hi, everyone. This is Tarveen, and I head entire accessibility practice at Magic EdTech. Thank you so much for joining today's session and trust me, it will gonna be interesting session as we are talking about 2.2. It will help you be future ready and be prepared for whatever you are doing. And we know it is still in the draft version, but yes, we have tried to put in our best to share the examples around how to implement the same. And Over hi everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm Erin Evans. I'm our Director of Accessibility and Consultant Solutions here at Magic Ed. We're really excited to have this conversation today. There's a lot of good stuff coming out with 2.2 and um, we're happy to share all of this information with you. Um, somebody just asked in the chat um, if they want a copy of the transcript, there is a recording happening. So if you guys want um, to take a look at that right now, there's a link in the chat. But um, as Anjali mentioned, we will be sharing out the recording and transcript of this um, seminar once we are done with it in a day or two so with that Anjali <laughs> so sorry <laughs> all right now we can go ahead and hop into our first poll question um so the question says what is the purpose of web, web content accessibility guidelines or WCAG and the first option for this question is to ensure all digital content is accessible to people with disabilities. The second option is to make web pages load faster. And the third option is to enhance visual design of digital content. So we'll give you guys a minute to go ahead and answer that. <laughs> I don't know. It's been up for a while. So, <laughs> so true. <laughs> Congratulations. We got hundred <laughs> percent. We wanted to give you guys a, a softball question this morning. Um, get everybody. <laughs> Uh, make sure we're all on the same page and we're all at the right recording and the right session for the day. So yes, the correct answer is to ensure that digital content is accessible to all people. Right, absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Erin. All righty, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Erin, um, can you give us a little bit of an introduction to WCAG and kind of tell us what it's all about? Absolutely. Well, obviously, you know, you guys that are here in, in participation have a, a good sense of uh, the web content accessibility guidelines. Honestly, I have no idea how to pronounce it. Is it WCAG, WCAG, the guidelines, the standards, you know, but WCAG is the um, acronym that is often used with it. They are standards that are put forward by yet another acronym, the World Wide Web Consortium or W3C which is an international community full of member organizations, a full-time staff and the public where they all work together to develop web standards. So as you all know, hopefully W3C um, is in charge of WCAG, but also they put out the web ARIA standards and other guidelines within web. 
Um, the content guidelines were originally developed in the late 1900s by the World the Web Accessibility Initiative. In 2008, 2.0 was released, which expanded those initial guidelines. And um, when we were pulling together information for this, I clicked through the link for the 1.0 guidelines. And if you haven't looked at them recently, that web page is definitely very like late 90s <laughs> in, in structure, but it's really good. And then 2.1 came out in um, 2018. That was um, the set of the standards and the guidelines that increased consideration for more technologies as well as disabilities. Overall, the guidelines have the single A, double A, and triple A. Those are the different levels that we can work towards for conformance. Level A is uh, what we would consider the bare minimum. Double A is where the majority of websites um, are aiming for. It's going to give you access for the majority of your users. Triple A is the gold standard and um, that they are the most rigorous guidelines to follow. Definitely, um, we know that there are people out there that are aiming for triple A and you, know, you, you start with double A. The good thing about the guidelines as you build through them, 1.0 is, um, you know, any, anything you catch on 2.0, you have covered in 1.0. Anything in 2.1 is covered in the 2.0. So they build on each other. Um, the importance of the accessible web content, as you all know, is that it's helping to benefit all of the users, especially those with disabilities. Um, I'm jumping around and I apologize for that. Um, going back to the structure of the guidelines, we all know the four principles of accessibility being perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And within the guidelines, within 2.1 right now, there are 78 success criteria and 443 different techniques to um, accommodate those success criteria. So there's a lot of detail packed into the guidelines themselves. And when we're working through and talking about compliance and talking about alignment to those guidelines, we start at the top of those, the four guiding principles and then the 13 um, guidelines within those and then working down through the success criteria. Tarveen, is there anything you want to add on to that? No, I think you have covered everything in detail on this slide for sure. <laughs> awesome. All righty. Thank you so much for that little introduction, Erin. All right. Now I think we have two more poll questions for you. So the first one is, what are some of the new accessibility requirements in WCAG 2.2? The first option for this is requirements for mobile devices and low vision users. The second option is requirements for high quality audio content. And the third option is requirements for content with complex uh, animations. So we'll give you a minute to go ahead and answer that. All righty, let's see what we have. All right, very nice. So the correct answer is requirements for mobile devices and low vision users. And now we have a second poll question that we'll jump into. Which disability groups are the WCAG 2.2 updates primarily focused on? The first option is low vision users. The second option is deaf or hard of hearing users. And the third option is users with cognitive and learning disabilities. All right, let's see what you guys said. All right, so the correct answer for this one is users with cognitive and learning disabilities. And just to clarify, it is not in saying that the other disabilities are not in consideration, but as you're going through the details of the updates, a lot of those considerations are for um, cognitive and learning disabilities, but obviously the changes will also positively impact low vision users and users of all abilities. Definitely. All right. So can we walk through a little bit of the WCAG 2.2 
guidelines and what they're going to entail? Sure. Um, so as we talked about at the beginning, we um, 2.2 is still in draft status, which means that they're not quite ready to send them out. They've actually been um, in public review and draft status for a little bit longer than they than um, had initially been anticipated with some reviews and changes. The latest data that we have is that they anticipate releasing these standards in April of 2023. So it, barring any um, unforeseen changes, what we have in draft status right now is um, what we anticipate to be coming out, which is what we're focused on today. Those changes and those updates include nine new success criteria, which we are going to go through each of those in detail in a little bit. Um, those success criteria are addressing those accessibility barriers that weren't um, included in 2.1. I don't want to say weren't considered, but weren't included in 2.1. Um, as we just discussed going through the poll questions, there is a little bit more of a focus on how to support users with cognitive disabilities. Mobile accessibility is a huge thing because obviously our technologies are constantly changing and evolving. So even from the updates in 2018, a whole five years ago, um, there have been a lot of updates in our technologies since then. Um, and there is also additional um, supports out there for users with low vision. Um, there are uh, guidelines that are broken out. So we have two new guidelines coming to level A and uh, the current WCAG 2.1 uh, guideline of 2.4.7, which is the focus visible, is getting a promotion. It is going from a level A to a level AA requirement in 2.2. Um, so it is something that I'm sorry, from a double A to a level A. So it is a required requirement. It's again, talking about that MVP level. So that is a change. It's not a new success criteria, but it is a, um, an upgrade. There will be five additional standards coming for your double A and two additional standards coming in triple A. Um, so in total, there will be the 58 guidelines for A and double A and 29 guidelines for triple A. Um, so, you know, as we go through the rest of the conversation today, um, we're going to walk you through what each of those guidelines mean, what they look like, and how um, you can successfully implement those as you're going forward. Tarveen, do you want to add to that? No, I think uh, you have covered everything, Erin. Awesome. So this is a little bit more, um, this is the slide here, we're showing a chart of which of the new criteria fall into which of those three levels. So um, consistent help and redundant entry will be level A. In the level AA is um, an update to focus appearance, focus not obscured, dragging movements, target size minimum sizing, accessible authentication and level triple a will be um, an extension of focus not being obscured as well as an extension of accessible authentication um, as i bumbled on the previous conversation 2.4.7 focus visible is moving from double a to single a as a mvp requirement and uh 4.1.1 which is parsing is actually being removed from the guidelines altogether. Um, when we send out this slide deck, which will be posted with the recording and with the video, you will um, have a link to all of these guidelines as well as to the uh, WCAG or WCAG as I saw in the chat, um, FAQs that are on the website. All right. Thank you so much, Erin. All right, Tarveen, can you talk to us a little bit about level A um, and, you know, consistent help? 
Sure. So as you as Erin has already covered, this is the first guideline uh, that is added to level A. Uh, what is consistent health? First of all, we need we will be relating each and every guideline to which type of disability is being taken into consideration and why we are targeting this request. So consistent help is more uh, to help people with cognitive and learning disabilities. Now what happens is we have seen that few of the pages doesn't have the help at the at the defined location so we need to have consistent help across pages wherever you traverse you need to have it is at the defined location one should have access whatever the case is it shouldn't be that help is only available at the home screen or the login page try providing a mechanism where people have access to the phone emailing messaging system and in these days, we know that we have the live chat bots that actually help people to get information really quickly. And I have shared few examples how consistent help can be incorporated. These are the live examples. You can go on the website and check for the same. So first one is the screenshot that I have taken from the Shop Western web page. It has the bottom panel that is consistent across entire web website and it talks about the contact details with the phone number the time at which the number will be available and then it will have a shortcut to email you can quickly send email to the support team and also a live chat with the chatbot and the bottom panel the uh, the screenshot below is from the marriott website they have the help at the top you just click it will move to the new page and it will have the entire help form available to the user to ask any of the given question. It is just to ease out and help people traverse your application in more effective way in case they are being stuck due to XYZ reason. So consistent help is to ensure have information readily available for people with cognitive and learning disabilities. Erin, do you want to add anything to this slide? Um, I think that is, you did a great job with that. What I would say is obviously it will help all users. Um, I can tell you um, when I have been on websites before, and I'm sure you guys have experienced this, you can't find that help box in an easy way. So this will be a great addition to um, having that extra supports in there. All right, thank you so much for that, ladies. Harvey, can you give us a rundown of this slide as well? Sure. So next one is redundant entry. I will first of all relate it to myself. I sometimes feel that why I need to fill this information twice in a given form, even if you are doing a shopping. So uh, I, what I end up doing is I just copy paste from the above fields and then just submit the details. But uh, trust me how how uh, repetitive it is for people with cognitive and learning disabilities and how hard it is for them to remember all of that information. So why not to ease out everyone's life? It is not limited to person with disabilities, but I think across we should always from usability standpoint, we should always talk about ease of use and this feature is actually what I feel is related to ease of use for any user. Now, what we should add, I have taken a screenshot where uh, that's the most widely used example by each one of you, shipping and billing address. We have seen people asking for this information at different pages. Now, how difficult is for me is to copy paste the content from the back screen to the next page that I have moved. So why not to have ease? Why not to just have a checkbox to copy paste? the information from the previous page where I have entered the same. So we should have ease of use. We should have allow re-entry like autofill option should be available to ease out this information. So that's what redundant entry is avoid asking for duplicate like same information twice during the access to a given user. It is important to note that, you know, the, the caveat there is, you know, unless there's requirement for security or invalid data, or maybe when we're doing online shopping, the CBC code on our credit cards. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, moving on to the next. 
So next one is the first guideline that is being added to AA compliance level that is 2.4.11 focus appearance. Uh, why focus appearance? Uh, earlier the guideline only used to say that focus should be visible but no one was talking about the color compliance of the focus that is appearing for a button or a link or a content. Now this will surely gonna help in my experience, we have really debated at instances where I requested that there is a focus, but it is not visible. What is the use of even having a focus in that place? So I'm thankful that this guideline is getting embedded into 2.2 release. Uh, what I have tried to do in the right section, I have tried to pull up the code basis, my knowledge and experience. What all changes are to be done in a HTML file? And there needs to be additional changes done to your JavaScript and CSS to ensure that focus is visible. Now, focus visibility can be done in three different ways. And that's what example is elaborating. Either you have a black or a white outline added to your uh, buttons. It could be basis, uh, the color contrast that is already there in the background. It could be of one pixel eight uh, that will help you meet the compliance. The best possible combination is to have two pixel thickness that will pass at any given instance, but ensure the color combination that you pick passes the background. The third one is to have a separated outline where you will have a white background in between the button or a link, and then the focus is visible as a separator to the user. Now, this actually helps the person with low vision because he or she will be able to traverse the content appropriately because he would be either using the zoom text tool and with the focus visible on the button or a, a person who is reliant on the keyboard navigation just using the keyboard navigation would have proper visibility of where he or she is during the traversing of a page Erin, do you want to add anything? The only thing I was going to say was I think you kind of covered it. I will say that we have seen when we've been doing um, assessments of different pages, exactly what you said, where there is an actual focus, but it's really hard to see. And it hasn't previously been a compliance issue. It's definitely been a usability issue. So this um, will, will definitely increase um, best practices and usability as we move forward. Yes, absolutely. Uh, moving on to the next slide, it talks about level again, a level double A 2.4.12 that is focus not obscured. Now what this guideline means, it is about designing interfaces that allows the user to quickly and easily access most of the information without being distracted by unnecessary elements. We have seen that whenever we traverse to a content or hover, the uh, the content that appears, it sometimes it's over and above the element where we have moved. So it actually disables and distracts the person and is not able to move, uh, like review the content properly so we should ensure and it's more of a role of a designer to ensure that content is intuitive engaging and effective and is all the more visible without any distraction now how we should be doing it ensure that we provide white spaces right contract ratio so that it's visible properly ensure consistency across your web pages so people can relate to and it's properly visible and located and we should also try using the headers being sticky and then you have a scroll padding again this is something that a potential future technique is people are talking about it i have also heard mixed views that this is not the right thing to implement we are still waiting for the right implementation once we reach at a level we might be sharing more information around it Erin, do you want to add anything to this one? I have nothing here other than to chime in and agree with one of the comments in the chat that sticky headers are the worst. <laughs> they I, do they do cause problems because they do block the content. So absolutely. Okay. 
moving on to the next one the next one is again a double a category which is 2.5.7 that is dragon speech movements now what dragon speech uh, sorry what dragging movement is dragging movement is we have seen that drag and drop is usually being used in a specific way but try to understand how difficult it is for people who are using input device such as trackball head pointer eye gaze system or speech controlled mouse emulator so we we wanted to have a alternative solution to ease out how this can be done effectively now i have shared few example that are live examples on the darren's page you can go and see these are fully accessible now what happens is uh like there is a drag and drop earlier we ha we have seen that you need to do the shift command select and then drop in the specific area it is very difficult if i am having like motor disability a person having parkinson's i'll not be able to do that action within the defined time frame it's better to have the sliders to easily drag to a given position or to have a rain slider like 1 2 3 4 that you see on the uh, screenshot at the bottom uh, i will just select the two number and it will it will move the content to that specific drop location so how easy it is for me to use drag and drop functionality I will say from personal experience on uh drag and drop I frequently have a hard time grasping that element as well so having this additional feature is definitely going to be um a benefit Did we lose Tarvi? I think we may have. Oh, oh there she is. <laughs> Don't run away from us, Tarveen. <laughs> so, so moving on to the next one, that's level double A, two dot five dot eight target size. Now, why target size came into picture and existence is again mobility impairment. Again, I will refer to the uh, Parkinson's and people with motor disability. How difficult is to select a icon with a smaller size? if it's a selectable icon and i need to perform some action so this guideline plays a very vital role and we have a standard pixelate information that what pixel size to be used to meet the compliance now if it's 44 by 44 it will eventually pass but guideline says it should be minimum 24 pixels this way you will pass the compliance but if you have a smaller icon like series of icon you should ensure that there is a spacing of 4 pixel if your size is 20 pixel ensure there is a 4 pixel space between the two icon so that you don't end up pressing the icon that you don't want to and if you have 20 by 20 and no space you will fail and will not be able to meet the compliance so spacing is all together helping us traverse the content more effectively and efficiently without like targeting a wrong button that i don't want to press yeah and the example that is on this slide is taken from w3c and it's a visual that shows different sizes of the target points and it will it also shows what you just said tarveen especially at the 20 by 20 pixel with no spacing how it is too small and everything is connected absolutely agree there okay moving on to the next one that is uh, 3.3.8 that is accessible authentication as we have seen people are talking about security compliance and everything and we have seen that uh, uh, you need to have some specific set of passwords being set for different website if you ask for capital letter then numbers then uh, special characters and trust me for me it is also difficult to remember 10 passwords for 10 different website because using same password is again a threat to whatever you are accessing on the internet so remembering everything is very hard so we should have alternative mechanism for accessing the content which is authenticated either have the facial recognitions the way we have for mobile phones 
and the fi- or the fingerprint scanning anyone and i have seen that android provides a very good feature if you have uh, like uh, enabled your phone with the fingerprint all the secure applications like uh, banks and others they will automatically get connected to the fingerprinting and you will have easy access you don't need to remember each and every password or you can the same sorry i mean i didn't mean to cut you off i just wanted to add that ios has done the same for face recognition that most websites that include passwords it'll face recognize you yes absolutely how easy it is and how efficient and effective it is absolutely uh you can also allow oauth web auth or two uh factor authentication that we have started seeing in most of the emails and again it is very effective and very secure uh and ability to paste password is something you can allow but i think i would prefer first two options because they are more secure compared to the third one uh so have accessible authentication for everyone I will say that this will be a huge improvement because when we have the captcha and we have the select the the boxes with the traffic light um oftentimes if you guys have noticed with their grids the traffic light is sometimes in that top right corner and you're not quite sure is that part of it so this will also be an ease on the usability and just the user experience on authentication Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Arun. Okay, moving on to the next one that is level uh, AAA. This is the first guideline added to AAA section that is 2.4.13. It is again focused not obscured. This is the enhanced version. Uh in 2.4.12 there was a option that it can be partially visible. without limiting the access or visibility to the user but in triple a we need to ensure that this is completely visible to the user without getting distracted or overlapped by the pop up or the screen that opens up on the focusable element so that's what this uh, guideline is all about <clears throat> there's no exception to this guideline erin anything you want to add Nope. <laughs> Moving on to the last guideline that we have in the kitty is again a AAA guideline 3.3.9 accessible authentication. I think we have covered lot more around authentication in 3.3.8. uh and uh, the one exception like exception that was there in 3.3.8 is we can allow the captcha thing with the object recognition like if you are being requested to uh select the traffic lights or the bus or the cars within the given images but in this aaa this is also not allowed you need to have compliant and captcha can't be considered as the accessible version for uh meeting the accessible authentication compliance level. Yeah, so um there's nothing I have specific to this one. Um I do want to say that we've gotten a couple of comments and questions that we understand there is a lot of information that we are sharing um and we do have a compressed time frame, but we will be um sending out this slide deck as well as the recording and transcript for everybody so for those of you or all of us who want to go back in and and go through and dive in a little bit farther um this will all be shared with you um in a couple of days all righty so we are prepared <laughs> um So throughout this uh session we kind of learned that WCAG 2.2 is still in draft um but this is you know what we see coming kind of what we can anticipate for now and it's important to be aware of these additional changes because it's only going to benefit your organization it's only going to make all of your content and your platforms more usable to everyone regardless of disability or not Um and you know we're encouraging uh implementing WCAG 2.2. Um if you have questions about it, if you need help in any manner, please reach out to any one of us and we are happy to help you navigate any of that. 
Um, we don't know when it will be a requirement um, or part of official RFP requests or laws. Um, but you know, if that is information that we get, we can definitely try and update you. Um, we'll try and post on LinkedIn as much as we can um, as we get those updates. And we can provide uh, audit data so that you can build it into your roadmaps if that's something that you're looking to do. Um, understanding what's coming will help you support your business and your new products, and it will also uh, bring in users that maybe weren't able to access some of your things before. And um, for any resources that you're looking for, you can go on to the W3C website, you can go on to ITIC website, uh, this will lead you to BPATS and any kind of ally community, whether that's Slack, whether that's LinkedIn, all of those will hold information about these things. But again, if you have any specific questions, feel free to reach out to us. So now, now we one can- thing, Oh, sorry, Anjali, before we move on to Q and A, one thing that um, we are already preparing for on our end is as we're looking um, through the audit reports, we want you to know that if that's data, as Anjali said, that you are looking for, we can help you to see, you know, where you are right now and, and future proof what you're doing. Additionally, Tarveen and I um, hang out in those accessibility communities quite often. So we are definitely on top of changes, communications, and we will be posting that information through those social channels, as Anjali just mentioned. Tarveen, do you have anything else you want to add on that? No, I think you guys have covered it pretty well. We have a few questions on the chat. Definitely. Alrighty, so we'll go ahead and start with Claire. She's submitted two questions to us. So Claire's first question is about consistent health. How do you imagine this influences point of use which are considered useful for users who are working with limited viewports due to Zoom or Magnify? So I think that that's a really good question, Claire. Um, I think it will depend on how the different uh, developers implement that use. I think if you are use if you are somebody that is using a um, a Zoom or have a, a smaller viewport, that will be where the development of ensuring the reflow and, and doing the testing of how that page is viewed on different devices will be important. I don't know if it's going to almost contradict the sticky header and be something that will be right there, but um, I will be really interested to see how it does pan out as this begins to be implemented. Tarveen, do you have anything you want to add on that? No, I think uh, that that's how it should be ideally. And uh, I think we'll have more clarity once uh, the things are being sorted, implemented, but people using Zoom anyways, they would need help and it needs to be in a pop proper format so that they can traverse between the screens and provide the information. Definitely. All right. So Leo submitted a question and he said, can you share a link to where I might be able to subscribe to WAI specifically when they release 2.2? I'm sure they'll send a fanfare email, but I'm not sure I'll get it. Uh, short my friends at Magic telling me. <laughs> well, your friends at Magic will certainly keep you up to date, but yes, we will share a link for where you can subscribe directly from WAI in case your friends at Magic don't get to you the second that release comes out. <laughs> All right, Sarah submitted a question. She said, I'm not clear on the difference between uh, W, or sorry, 24, 24 <laughs> and 44 requirements. Um, I understand the 20 plus four being similar to 24. Yes. So uh, 44 is the example that is being shared, but guidelines says anything above 24 will meet the compliance. So 44 was the best example to tap, select, and the area was like well-defined for any person using your website. 24 is the best recommended from the uh, guideline standpoint. So if you meet 24, we are good. 44 was the best of best example that is being shared. All right, thank you so much for that, Tarveen. And I think in the chat earlier, we had a few questions as well, so I'll just run through those. Uh, Sushil, I'm so sorry if I butchered that name, asked how 2.4.11 is different from 1.4.11. 
doesn't 1.4.11 suffice this need? That's a really good question. And um, when I was looking into that, because I saw it and I wanted to pull it up, 1.4.11 is, or 11, is really about the element as a whole. So if you think about the button, which is going back to the example that we were sharing on the screenshot, just the button element itself, if it's blue, has to be a blue contrast that's meeting that three to, three to one against the background. It was not taking into consideration what the focus around that active element is. What the difference is on the what's coming is that there is now a requirement that that focus is around the whole element and that that focal focus is going to be meeting those contrast guidelines as well. Tarveen, do you want to add to that? No, I think you have covered it right. And I also shared the same example during the conversation that 1.4.11 used to say that you should have the visible focus, but no one talked about the compliance level from the color standpoint, whether it's passing or not. I have seen like dotted uh, uh, highlight is appearing like just behind the button, but it is nowhere visible if I'm a low vision user or if I'm a uh, person with color impairment. So that's the reason this guideline has come into picture to ensure it meets the compliance from the color standpoint. It's properly visible to anyone. All right. Thank you so much for that, Tarveen. Um, Another question that we got in the chat box earlier was from Christine and she asked, 3.3.8, how do these solutions compare with user, a password keeper? Uh, what was the question? Can you repeat that again? Sure. Um, she asked 3.3.8, how do these solutions compare with, uh, I think it's supposed to be a user password keeper. I think she just flipped the words, maybe. So when with the redundant solution, and if you have a password, like an autofill password that you're already using, how is that different from the requirements of what's coming? So using password keeper is actually enabling you store all your password, but uh, not all the website allow you to extract that information easily when you are at a web page. So that's the reason uh, might be due to security reason it is not authorized to even paste the required password that's the reason we are recommending there should be alternative solution like uh, fingerprint and face recognition to ease out the access all right <clears throat> thank you and i think our last question is from siggy and he asked 3.3.8 is this mobile only or does it apply to the web at also three dot three dot it will apply it will apply to the web as well as mobile all righty and i think those are all of the questions that we have for now we do have a few more minutes so if they we have any questions that are still ling lingering please feel free to drop them And while you're doing that, if we can move to the next slide, I know some of you um, saw this quickly at the beginning. Tarveen and I will be traveling out to Anaheim in a few weeks for the CSUN Assistive Technology Conference. If you or anyone that you work with or that you know will be there and are interested in having an in-person conversation with us, we would love to set that up. So um, feel free to drop a note at the accessibility at magicedtech.com uh, email address. We would love to see you. I'm excited because it'll be the first time I get to meet Tarveen in person because uh, Noida is not quite down the road from me. <laughs> um, but we're looking forward to the conference. There's some great presenters that are lined up and it's always um, it's always a really good time and a lot of great information. So if you're there or you know people, let us know. We'd love to connect. Absolutely, Definitely. absolutely. And thank you, Emmy. We'll surely love to connect with you. And Chris will catch next time for sure at season. <laughs> All righty. I think we have two more questions that came in during that time. So John asked another question regarding 2.4.11. A common method is to use box shadow to show focus. Thoughts about this? So I would, my thought on, on the shadows are, um, 
they're honestly, to me, they're more distracting, but I think what's most important from a compliance standpoint is ensuring that you're meeting that color contrast and those guidelines. So the shadow, you could maybe keep the shadow as long as you have that, um, that two pixel outline around it. I think there are different ways you can investigate how that will work, but um, that's, that's my opinion combined with what the standard is going to say, Tarveen. Absolutely. I think uh, it is more about ensuring that content is like person who is accessing is not getting distracted and the focus uh, element is properly visible. That's what the entire motto of this guideline. All right. And I think our last question is from Andrew. And he said for 3.2.6 consistent health, what's an example of a change uh, initiated by the user that would make it okay to have the help move? For example, it's okay to warn the user if you go into this area of our app, the app will move. So um, what happens is at many instances, user end up moving to the another page and he has initiated a change like traversing to from one page to another page he'll not be able to find the required help on our product so that's what it means the change initiated by user if he's traversing away from our website or doing any other action where he might not have access to the help that's what this actually talks about all righty Thank you so much. I think that that concludes our question portion. Um, I think we just want to say thank you so much to everyone who has taken the time to join us today. We really appreciate it. And we hope that you got something out of this session. Um, we will be hosting another Magically Live soon. I don't think we necessarily have a date pinned down yet, but we will definitely send out an email and post on LinkedIn and all those good things so that you know when our next one is and what the subject is. Um, and yeah, I think we're always looking for new topics. So if you have any suggestions or anything that you'd like to see, feel free to message us or, you know, email magic or anything like that. And we would love to kind of dive into those with you. Sure. Thank you, everyone. It was nice catching up with you all. Yes. Thank you all for being here. Um, we appreciate your time. And if you have any questions, definitely let us know. We will see you at our next session. Definitely. And like we said before, the recording, the transcript, and the PowerPoint will be shared with you in a few days. All right. Thank you. Bye, all. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye.